I really want to talk about something that has been on my heart for the last nine months, maybe even longer for the last 10 months. Um, um, I want to talk about the fall of Christian leaders um, in, in the world. So I don't know who you are right now. And I don't know if you keep abreast or you keep in touch with what is going on in the world. Um, but if you do, you already know who I'm talking about. Or, uh, um, uh, so, uh, um, yeah, I just want to address it. Now, the names I, I'm going to mention, um, it does not mean I'm against them personally. I'm not against them. I'm not naming them to shame them. So let me make that very clear. Uh, whenever we name Christian leaders that fall, I hope that we adopt a posture where we don't name them to shame them. I hope we name them just to learn from uh, some spiritual lessons and what we can learn from them. So I'm going to name three names and then I'm going to stop because I don't want to keep bringing up the names, all right? Because it's not about the person, it is about the principle of, 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 of tonight. So firstly, I'm gonna, I want to talk about the fall of Ravi Zacharias. So I think we all know him. Um, but if you don't, all you need to do is Google him and, and, and you will know him. So Ravi Zacharias is a very famous apologist. He started the RZIM ministry. Um, he's been in the ministry since he was, if I'm not mistaken, 18 years old. And he passed away close to 70 or something. So it's what, a span of 50 years. And he's, he's, he's very anointed. He's very authoritative. And he has written so many books and so many materials for the church, global church, I might add. And he has touched many lives. Um, and he has currently fallen because of a, um, a sexual scandal. Um, and all the, all, somehow all the, all the preachers tonight um, all fell because of sex. But there's also money and power, okay? But tonight, somehow, it's all sex. The second one I, I want to talk about is Carl Lenz. If you don't know who he is, he's, um, he's, he's the lead pastor of Hillsong East Coast or Hillsong um, America East Coast. Um, he is a very charismatic preacher. There are so many young preachers who want to be like him. I, um, um, he's one of the guys, um, and, and if, if you, there's many pictures of him thrown across the internet. So if you Google him and you Google beach, you see like, he's not just anointed, but he, he's something Pastor Aaron wants to be, you know, he's anointed, but also very fit. Um, so Carl Lance is super fit. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about that, but it's important to me, okay, to be really fit. Uh, uh, I'm a dad. And one thing that I don't want to have is a dad bod. But um, unfortunately, that, that, that may not happen. I, that, I, I think I've lost that objective. I think I, I, since the MCO, I blame the MCO for this. I, I, I put on a little bit of weight. Uh, true story. This is a true story. My son, my, my oldest son, my two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old son, now he goes around. Um, he's, when I'm eating on the table, he comes up to me on the floor. He lifts up my shirt. He squeezes uh, my midriff, and then he looks at me. He goes, fat. <laughs> this is a true story. He doesn't even do it just once. He, he does it like every other day. And I'm like, yes, I know. I know your dad's fat. So please, I try to throw my wife under the bus. I'm like, who's fatter? Me or mom? Me or mommy? Me or mama? Who's fatter? And he, he still says it's me. It's still not fair. Um, uh, I'm training him to say, no, it's, uh, it's mama. But uh, then, then I'd get no love from my wife. So anyways, point aside, Carl Lenz fell because he had an extramarital affair. All right, so just Google him, you will know. But he is, he is such an up and coming rising star. He's one of the people that I was, I was really banking on to bring the gospel and make it cool again, you know? Um, I was so sad. I was really sad by that news. Ravi Zacharias hit me like a brick. Uh, Carl Lentz hit me like a stone wall. And then the last one, I don't know if you know him, Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell Jr. to be, to be really exact. If you don't know him, again, Google him. Please don't Google him now, Google him later. Um, Jerry Falwell is a, the president of Liberty University. So I picked these three because I picked one apologist, I picked one pastor, and I picked one theologian. Um, and all three, which means that just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you don't fall. Just because you're a theologian, the president of a university, doesn't mean you don't fall. Just because you're an apologist, it doesn't mean you don't fall. So just because you're a Christian leader doesn't mean you don't fall. So Jerry Falwell fell because um, he also fell sexually. And it was, it was sad because if you're in the scholarly world, you will know that Liberty University is maybe top five Christian universities around the world, but they're really, 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 really famous. Um, they hold big congregations, big talks every year, and they invite the big names to, to, to preach. And his fall has reverberated in the academic Christian world um, and has got people asking. Okay, so these three people, I, I don't know how you feel about it. 
but I don't want to talk about why church leaders fall so much. Okay, maybe I will a little bit. But if you just Google it, you will hear, you will, you will read about many, many articles on why church leaders fall. You will also read many, many articles on how we can uh, safeguard the church from, uh, to help church leaders not fall. So I'm not going to cover that. But I want to cover something else that so far I have not read online. Okay. Uh, okay. My lower thirds are there that I've not read online and I really want you to hear me. I have 30 minutes. Okay. Whenever we hear of a Christian leaders that fall, and there are many, there are many right now on my list of Christian leaders, I have at least 20, 25 over the last just five years. There are many, there are big time leaders that fall, but there are also many, many small time leaders that fall. And there are also many Christian leaders that walked away from their faith. There is a new word in the Christian world called the deconstruction of your faith. So there are many Christian leaders who are claiming that they are deconstructing their faith, which means that they're, they're really pulling their faith apart and they're really questioning whether this Christian faith is for them. But every time we hear of a leader that fall, the first question, the first reaction I'd like to see from people is, how do you respond? How do we respond when we first hear a Christian leader at fall? Now, there are many responses, right? If we hear Jerry Faldwell, he's an academic, we go, maybe, maybe I understand, you know, maybe he's dry in the spirit. That's why he fell, because in the academic world, maybe they're not spirit-led, maybe they're conservative, so they don't speak in tongues, they're not led, so maybe they're dry, they don't really believe in God. Studying the Bible is just something, head knowledge, not heart knowledge. Yeah, get why he fall. You see a guy like Carl Lenz. Why did I mention he's so fit? Because you, you look at him and you go, oh, he's really good looking. He's really trendy. He's really fit. He can talk so well. He's so eloquent. He's so gifted. He's so anointed. He's not only that, he's also tall. And my God, he, he's so young. He looks like he has got it all. No wonder he fell. He mixed around with celebrities and with really hot women and models and, and they go on yachts and they, they drink alcohol uh, without his wife there. No wonder he fell. Of course he would fall. I could have seen it from a mile. If I was his friend, I would have told him you would fall. Then we see a guy like Ravi Zacharias. Some, a guy that he, he, he doesn't wear flashy clothing. Well, I've never seen him. He's not fit. And I'm not judging the man, okay? But if you look at him, he's not that fit, all right? He, well, well, I mean, he's in his 60s-ish. He's not that fit. But the reason why I say he's not fit is because we all know he's got a, a lower back pain for his whole life. Which, so it's not like he can build his muscle or anything. He's, he's in pain 24 hours. And he's, he's elderly and he looks so gentle. He looks so kind. And he's, if you think Carl Lenz and Jerry would fall, Ravi would be the last person you think he'd fall. He preaches against sexual immorality for his whole life. He'll be the last person he fall. And then when he, he falls, you go, oh my gosh, I knew it. I knew he's a hypocrite. I knew he, he was lying to us. I knew he was just preaching out of his head, not out of his heart. What's the, what's the point I'm trying to make? How do we respond when Christian leaders fall? Think about your local leaders as well. What if one day I fall? What would you say? I knew it. I knew this Isaac would fall. He played too much PlayStation. He, how come he knows how to play StarCraft and Dota? I knew it. I knew he was going to fall online some more. I knew it. What's the point here? The point is that the first reaction as Christians and a leader fall is to judge them. Am I not right? We, we want to find a reason why they fall because it, we want to make sense of it. And by doing so, we have judged them. And that symptom plagues almost all of us. After we have judged them, then we become angry at them. And you go, you, you lied to me. You, you bluffed me. I followed your preaching. I read your books. I listened to your principles. And then now you fall. You bluffed me. You preach uh, against sexual immorality. You preach against talking to a girl one-on-one. -on -one, and then you bluffed me. Now you fall. And what are you trying to prove? This church is this, church is that. So we first, we judge. Then we condemn. And we're doing exactly the two things that the Bible tells us not to do. But we fall under that trap. Now, if you're guilty of it tonight, uh, uh, don't raise your hands uh, uh, because I sometimes find myself guilty of that. Like I, with Carl Lenz, I go, oh, it's sad. With Jerry Falwell, I go, well, all right. But with Ravi Zacharias, I think he hit me hard because I, I read his books. I, I, have, I have nine of his books. I read cover to cover. I, you know, I, I follow his preaching. I follow his preaching 
so much so that sometimes I download the videos just so that I, in my head, I'm like, one day if, if, if Google and Alphabet falls, they bring YouTube with them and I'll lose some of his content. So I, I get crazy now to download some of his videos so I can keep it forever. That's how, my, how much I was disappointed. And I did judge, I did condemn. And, and I'm telling all of you right now, um, if you fall under that category, don't. I think we need to stop it. So then how should we respond? I think we need to respond first by looking at ourselves first, honestly. I don't, I, honestly, it doesn't really matter to me if you're married, not married, relationship, not relationship, boy, girl, young, old, new to the faith, old to the faith. It really doesn't matter to me. I think we need to take a look at ourselves. Number one, really, who are we to judge? I mean, if Jesus didn't, who are we to judge? Am I not right? We can be disappointed. That's not wrong to be disappointed, but it is wrong to judge and condemn. I think that's a little bit uh, uh, wrong because one day, what if, now, uh, it's, it is my pride, it's my honor, it's my pleasure to really pastor the young adults. But I, and I hope I will never fall. But what if one day I do something crazy? Uh, uh, what if one day in a weak moment I fall? I would hope that the people closest to me don't judge me or condemn me. I hope that the people closest to me would pray for me, would be there for me, would text me and say, you know, how are you? Uh, 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 um, um, is there anything I can do for you? Uh, um, um, can I help you through this? Uh, are you going through a, 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 a depression? Are you emotionally compromised? Can I talk to you? Can we hang out? Can we have a coffee? I would hope so. And I would hope that the people close to Ravi, Carl and Jerry would have done so for them instead of judging and condemning them. So what I'm saying to you, how should we respond? Number one, take a look at ourselves. Number two, we should really start taking, um, um, maybe the word is repentance. I think, okay, I, I want to go in that in another question. So I'm, I'm really jumping my own question here. But how, how, how should we respond is number one, take a look at ourselves. I'll, I'll talk about that later. Really take a look at ourselves and say, look, we are not perfect. I am not perfect. And if, okay, I want to move on. Otherwise, I'll, I cannot finish. Is that okay? I hope that's okay. I can't see you now. This is, I, sometimes I really don't like this Zoom thing. Not because I don't like Zoom, but it's because I can't, I can't see your face. I don't know if you're bored. I don't know if you're crying in tears because you're so bored. Not because you're happy or sad, because you're so bored or emotionally moved. Okay. Now, the second question. <clears throat> um, now that we've responded in disappointment or anger, how should we, uh, uh, should we now be extra uh, cautious, not precautious. Should we now be extra cautious towards all Christian leaders? And we would double and triple check their lives uh, and everything they say. Uh, uh, all these questions were, were posed to me. Is that okay? Uh, uh, by some, of, some, some people, uh, even myself. I don't blame you. And even for me, sometimes I go, man, if, I, if Ravi Zacharias was my past senior pastor of, of, of SIBKL, if no pastor Chu is, so don't worry. Okay. But if just, if hypothetically speaking, Rafi is, and he's still alive and somehow he's still the senior pastor, would I now just double check, triple check everything he say and, and, and start to take precautionary measures against everything he say. Now guard my own self so that I'm not hurt anymore. You know, I don't trust him anymore. Now, is that, the, is that, is that the posture we take with all church leaders? Because you look at Ravi and you look at us. When I say us, there's four pastors in this, in this group tonight. You look at all of us. All of us are, can fall. We're not, we're not immune from falling. My, my, my recommendation is this. I think we should be cautious, but check our motivation. I think we should be able to speak into the life of our pastors as well as allow our pastors to speak into our lives. But the motivation there should be out of love and out of care and out of, of, of a place where I go, you know, uh, I'm asking not because I want to call you out. I'm asking not because I want to I wanna judge you. I'm asking because I just want to make sure all is okay. I want to pray for you. I want to love you. As opposed to the motivation of double, check, double checking, triple checking, everything the pastors say, the motivation to, 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 to find fault with the pastor, to call the pastor out. The moment something goes wrong in the pastor's life, you call him out and you, you, you say, I knew it. I knew you were wrong. I knew you were a hypocrite. I knew you were manipulating me. I knew you were lying to me. And I think that's not the posture we should take. 
I, I think the Bible is very clear. Everything we do, we do it out of love. If we don't do it out of love, we're just a resounding gong. We're a resounding symbol. We're just, we're just useless. So I call, I, I'm, I'm urging all of us that um, the posture we should have right now uh, towards church leaders is to cover us in prayer, to help us. Uh, um, it's very difficult to pastor uh, a church where the church is always waiting for your next fall. It's always waiting to catch you when you fall. It's very difficult. I don't even want to talk about a church. Can you imagine being in a relationship where your spouse, every second and every minute, is always waiting to catch you when you make a mistake? It's a very stressful relationship. Same goes for the church. It's very stressful for the pastors, and I'm sure it's very stressful for you. So I think it should be motivated in love. So just be there for us as we want to be there for you. I'm speaking for the four of us and I'm, I'm hoping that, that you were here and, and you will not allow this judgy, condemning, bitterness, anger towards church leaders to really defile you, okay? Next question. Why do church leaders fall? Now, you can Google this and there's a lot of reasons, but I'll say one way church leaders fall is, I don't know, one reason I, wanna, I like to give is we think too much of ourselves. We think that we are beyond reproach that we are beyond feedback. Uh, I think that's one big reason why we fall. Uh, um, um, there are many, but I want to pick on this one. And I want to encourage now, especially the pastors here, Aaron, Miranda, and Joel, then the zone leaders, then the cell leaders, then the chorus, then all the members, that none of us, none, no pastor is ever beyond reproach. When I say beyond reproach, means none of us are unapproachable. So like as if we are gods and kings that you cannot approach us and you can never say anything about us. No, I want to say humbly before all of you that we are uh, uh, approachable. I hope, okay, we are approachable. And if we ever get to a point where you cannot even approach us to talk to us, to even ask us like uh, a simple question, like for, for example, uh, um, that day, okay, I hope this will never happen, but if it ever happens, like it happens to me, uh, um, um, now these days I can't go out to a hawker store or one U and I don't bump into someone from SIB KL, uh, uh, right? Um, but if you ever catch me sitting in a coffee shop, drink, having a drink of coffee with a girl and you look at that girl, please take a look at who the girl is. You can even take a photo if you want or video. And that girl is not my wife. Please come up to me and ask, on the spot or even later, or talk to my wife, go talk to my wife. It will not be talking behind my back. If it's something, if it's me uh, doing something with another girl, one-on-one -on -one in a coffee shop, talk to my wife. I, I give you permission, that's fine. Please come and talk to me. And if I come back at you and I scold you and I rebuke you and I shout at you and I swear at you, then some, I need to take a look at my life. Something's wrong. I'm not, I should never be beyond reproach. And just so you know that girl, but don't judge me yet, yeah? Please don't judge me nor condemn me yet because it has happened to me before. Okay, let me tell you a funny story because it's getting a little serious. One day I was in a coffee shop and this is a true story. Um, it was at Damansara Jaya, right? I was in a coffee shop. I was ordering food. Um, it was with a girl. And that time I was already with, with, with Kim. Yeah, I was already with Kim. Uh, um, I was ordering food, right? And I sat down with, with her and we ate. It was dinner. Yes, we ate. Uh, and then we had a drink and everything. We're talking. And I was laughing and I was having fun. She was having fun. So, uh, somebody saw us. My friend saw us. And then looked, looked at me very funny because the, he, he knows I was dating Kim at that time. Looked at me very funny. And I was like, why are you looking at me so funny? What's the big deal? And, he was, and he's like, oh, who is this? Uh, and then I was like, all oh, right, I see. I see where the confusion is. Uh, let me introduce you to my sister. <laughs> she just came back from the States. I know she's really pretty. She looks like me. So we look like a good couple, but no, she's my sister. <laughs> and we're just, we just, you know, haven't seen her for a year. I haven't spoken to her for a year. That's why we're having fun. Okay. Um, so like I said, when you, if you ever do catch me, don't judge me. Don't condemn me on the spot. Just come and ask me, who is that person? It could be a cousin. It could be a sister. It could be Kim's sister that she's counseling me. Doesn't mean I'm counseling her, right? I do counsel me sometimes, right? So don't judge me, don't condemn me, but um, 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 approach me. So leaders should never be beyond reproach. And I speak for myself, um, Aaron, Miranda, and Joel as well, okay? Should we then dismiss the content of all the fallen leaders? Now, Carl Lenz have written books. Ravi have written books and materials. Jerry Falwell have written textbooks. He didn't even write books. He writes textbooks. It's academic textbooks, right? Should we not, should we get rid of, should I have, should I throw away all Ravi's books right now off my shelf? 
and dismiss the content? Because a lot of people have said, you know, you 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 lied to me, and therefore I'm I I want to throw everything away. Now, hear me hear me well, hear me correctly, and I know some people have already said this. If you were to throw away all the content of fallen leaders, there will be no content left for you in the world. Absolutely zero. There'll be no content left. I'm a fallen leader. My my me falling may not be sexually, may not be power, may not be money. The three big big things how men fall, but my falling could be, yeah, I, I, I do ask to love your wife, but I, I do fall. I, I, I'm not 100% perfect. I, 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 I do argue with my wife. You just have to ask her, do Isaac argue with you? She would say yes. She would also say it's 99% her fault. Uh, that's why we argue. That's what she would say. I would agree with her. No, I, this, this is a joke, this is, this is, please. Uh, she will never say that. Trust me. Trust me on that. Okay. <laughs> she will say it's 100% her fault. That's why she will never say 99. Okay. And that's another, another joke. Um, but I'm a fallen leader. If you get rid of all my content just because I, I, I say one F word because I'm angry one day or just because, you know, I woke up at the wrong side of the bed and then I'm just in a grumpy mood the whole day, you know, then get rid of all my content. Get rid of everybody's content. You think Pastor Chu has never felt? Uh, uh, again, not sexually, not money or power. I'm sure what he would have bad days. I'm sure he would have argued. I'm sure he would have done crazy things. You know, I, uh, Pastor Chu once just told a story about Bruce Walkie that he stepped into uh, his lecture hall and and he the, the first sentence out of his mouth is he Bruce Walkie is one of the Christian academic lecturers. Uh, old way back then, way back then. Okay. He stepped in and he said to his class and he said, you know, uh, I'm going to confess something to you that I, I, I cheat in my tax return and I watch pornography. I am not a perfect uh, leader. And he's big. He wrote a lot of academic textbooks. But do I still read his textbooks? I do. Because uh, uh, if I don't, you might as well throw away the Bible. David fell, didn't he? You still read the Psalms. You still read Samuel. Paul, you think Paul didn't fall? He fell. It's just that we don't know how he fell. He said he he had a thorn in his flesh. Everybody has speculated what that thorn is. Is it girls? Was it money? A lot of people think it's money. Um, A lot of people think it's girls because maybe he's single. A lot of people think it's power because he had a lot of power. I'm sure he, he did crazy things. We still read the New Testament, don't we? You think Peter didn't fall? Peter followed crazy ways here in the, new, in the Gospels. We still, we still read the Gospels, don't we? So I would say the content that God gave is from God. He has to use human vessels to deliver his content. And the human vessels will fall, but the content will still remain as God's content. Is that okay? So when Ravi says, now I want to quote Ravi, when Ravi says, don't text a girl one-on-one unless it's got to really got to do with work or your colleague, don't text her about life or about especially her personal life and her personal looks and everything, right? Something like that. And he, he goes and do it. Should I dismiss the principle just because he did it himself? No, the principle is still a godly principle. It's just that the man could not live up to his own principle. That's okay. He's not Jesus Christ. Only Jesus lived up to 100% of his principle. Is that okay? Yep. So no, don't dismiss content. And please don't throw away Ravi Zechariah's book. I'm sure there are a lot of good content out there. How can we not lose faith in God and church after all this? That's a good question. I know a lot of people that, that has been absolutely affected uh, um, by all this. I know, and I read online, I don't know personally, I don't know about you, but I read online that a lot of people have left. You know, Hillsong has, is going through a scandal at the moment, not because of Carl Lentz, but also because of money. They're also because of, uh, of another sex thing, right? And, of, and, 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 and internal queries. Hillsong is going through a major global uh, 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 shift and scandal at the moment. And I read a lot of people who have attended Hillsong have lost their faith. And I would like to encourage all of you, if you lose your faith because a church leader fell, you have to ask yourself the hard question. Was your faith placed on that leader or was your faith placed on Jesus? 
if your faith was placed on Jesus, then I can guarantee you, every church leader will disappoint you. There will be no exception. Every church leader will disappoint you. But if your faith is placed and anchored in Jesus Christ, I think you'll be okay. Because our faith in Christianity is not based on how perfect men are. It is based on how perfect Jesus is. Can I remind all of you this? And when, whoever you're going to talk to, you can quote me because there's no copyright in the kingdom. And do you, when you quote this, don't say it's from Pastor Isaac. Just say it's from you and the Holy Spirit. And that's fine, right? Just say your faith is placed on the person of Jesus, not on men. So if you are finding your faith shaky, then ask yourself the hard question. Did you or have you placed too much faith on Christian leaders to carry you through the end times, to finish your race with you? And if you have, your faith will be shaken when a church leader falls. I encourage you, put your faith in Jesus Christ only. This is a good time. Every time a church leader falls, it is a good time to take a look at your life and go, where does my faith come from? Next question. If there are so many scandals, then what is the point of a church institution? It's a good question, right? If there's, if, 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 look, if, if RZIM falls, if Hillsong falls, if, if Liberty University falls, if Bill Hybels' uh, church falls, if, if, if Ted Haggard's church falls, if there's so many Christian leaders out there that have mega churches that fall. What then is the point of the Christian institution? Then you ask me, if we are the church, why can't I just be a church and uh, meet two of my friends and then just sing worship songs? Why don't I even need to go to an institution, a church body? And I want to encourage you again, just because the church leader falls does not mean that the church is evil. Just because Ravi fell. What, are you got, you're going to deem the whole RZIM evil? Is, do you not believe that it was God that set up RZIM? Do you not believe that it was God that set up Hillsong? It was God that set up that church and the church leader falls. God is still the king and the shepherd of that church. And if you believe that, then your faith in the church institution should not waver. It should not. Unless you think that that church institution was made and created by that man. Then I ask you the same question. Where do you place your faith? On that man or on Jesus Christ? So if you believe that Jesus Christ created the church, birthed the church, and I use SIBKL now. If you believe that God, Jesus is the king of SIBKL, and if one day one church leader falls, and I pray that never happens in SIBKL, if, if that happens, what are you going to do? You're going to leave SIBKL? If you leave SIBKL, you're almost saying to God that I'm going to leave your church, not that man's church, your church. And you're accountable to God. You're not accountable to me. You're not accountable to, 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 to any church pastors for your salvation or for your faith or for your whatever. You're accountable to God ultimately, ultimately accountable to God. So I would say there is still a huge point in a church institution because if we're starting the book of Revelation. What does he call the church? He calls the church his body. He calls his, the church his bride. Is his bride perfect? Of course not. If his bride is perfect, there will be no need for a bridegroom. If all you girls are perfect, you don't need a groom. If all we men are perfect, we don't need a bride because we're perfect. Perfect means I don't need anybody else to fulfill me. I, I, I fulfill myself in myself, right? So of course, the church institution is still a church institution. It's still called by God. And I still believe that. Next. Sorry, it's getting a bit intense, right? Can we still trust the church? Can we still trust church leaders? There are two different questions here. So I put it side by side. Can we still trust the church? Well, you've got to ask yourself, who is the church? You are the church. Can, you're almost asking yourself, can we trust me? A lot of people are asking, can we trust the church? Now, this is more of a pre-believer question than a believer question, right? But if, I'm talking to believers right now. Can we still trust the church? Yes, because you are the church. You need to be trusted. You make up the church. Can we still trust church leaders? I would say, yes. You're going to have to because... Who else is going to lead the church? God called. There's the five, the five uh, apostolic movement, right? God called leaders to be uh, pastors, to be uh, uh, missionaries, to be teachers. Uh, and there's two more, I remember, right? So I believe God still called men. Now, 
how can we trust church leaders? Let me try to keep my answer short because it's 9.55. So I allow you to, uh, if you have to leave by 10, uh, okay, I, I will not be offended. But if you can stay, stay for 15 more minutes. Is that okay? Um, um, how can we trust church leaders? Can I say this? I truly believe, I truly believe, and this is a personal opinion now, okay? Not a biblical one, a personal opinion. My personal opinion is this. I believe that God will give ample opportunities for the church leader to repent of his ways. It is up to the church leader to take that opportunity and repent. How do I know this? It's because, remember King David? He did wrong, right? And by the way, King David did worse than all three men combined, okay? All right. No, none of the three men killed anybody, all right? David did, all right? Let's put it that way. Okay. When Nathan, the prophet Nathan confronted David, David immediately repent. And if you don't, and that's how I know I can still trust David. So if David were to be my senior pastor right now, this King David, if he fell, he committed adultery, didn't he? But if he come forward and absolutely repent publicly, I might add, and David did it publicly. He went to the altar. I don't think he even closed the door. I think he held to the horns. And I think all the high priests, the priests will be able to see the king at the altar. So I believe that a public scandal requires a public repentance. And if my leader repents, and I genuinely believe he repents over a period of time, and he carries that repentance. And repentance here means, means that an absolute change of direction, which means that I cannot be going back on my same old ways, yeah? I'm absolutely repented, yeah? I believe we can still trust our church leaders. For example, let me give an example. And this is, an, is just pure hypothetical. If Aaron or Joel comes up to me, sorry, uh, Miranda would be going to a female pastor. But if Aaron or Joel comes up to me and says, hey, look, you know, we've, we've done something wrong and, and we, we regret it. Uh, um, and it's something that I need to remove them from the pastor title because it's serious, right? But I, I will say, look, you, you, do you admit that you're wrong? Yes. Do you repent? Yes. Then let's do it together. Let's journey together. One, one way the church institution can improve is to be able to accept a pastor that has fallen and have repented and it is now walking with Jesus in a new life. I think all of us, once the pastor fall, we kick him to the dust and we say, Salavi, thank you for coming. Good luck to you. So I think we need to look at our lives and say, yes, we can still trust church leaders, but there needs to be an absolute brokenness and a repentant heart. Is it unfair to the victims when we close a scandal case by just saying that we are all sinners? Now, this is particularly in, in, in Ravi's case. I would say, yes, it's very unfair. It's very unfair to the victims if we just close the case by simply saying we're all sinners. So what can we do? Ravi's a sinner. He's a man. He's a sinner. What can, we, what can we do? Let me close the case. Like I said just before, I think if any leader, now I'm talking to leaders in my midst in this, in this Zoom meeting, now I'm also talking to members. If any one of you fall, remember the first point I made, take a look at yourself. Take a look at your own fallenness. Take a look at your own sins. And if you fall and your excuse is, what to do? I'm a sinner. Saved by grace. It's okay. Right? Move on. Then I beg you to take a, look at your, take a look at your life. I beg you to read the New Testament. I beg you to read Revelations. Read Revelations until chapter 15. Go for it. The whole point of Revelations is faithfulness and repentance. Faithfulness and repentance. And I say to every Christian, not just leaders, the moment you find yourself trespassing God, not pleasing God, it is time to repent. God will give you ample opportunity to repent until a time where he goes, I love you too much for you to continue living in your sin. I will now interfere and there will be a consequence. I believe God gave Ravi an opportunity to repent. It was a case three years before 2020. I believe that was a public opportunity for him to repent. And this is not just my opinion. This is the opinion of a lot of respected theologians out there. But he did not take that opportunity. And that's why people believe why this is happening now. And I also do believe that. So I, I'm calling you in 2021, it's not too late. How do I know it's not too late? 
because you're breathing. The fact that you're not dead yet means it's not too late. It is only too late when you die. That's too late. So if you're breathing, please take an opportunity to repent. And if you repent, I believe, you know, in Romans, it says, where law increased, grace increased even more. And that's what I really believe and I want to release to you. But grace cannot increase if there is no repentance for that grace. You understand what I'm saying? I don't believe that when law increases, you sin. That's why there's more grace. That's why it's okay that you don't have to say sorry. You don't have to repent. That's not what I believe. I believe law increased, you repent, therefore grace increased all the more. And that's how we should live as Christians. We don't judge you. We don't condemn you. We journey with you in your repentance. And after your repentance, I believe God will restore you and he will bring you back. And then grace will increase even more and you will be a walking testimony. But we cannot have a redemption if you do not repent. Okay, I want to move on. Ooh, I've got now 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. How do we respond to other faiths? who after reading about all these scandals, accuse us Christians of being liars, hypocrites, and manipulators. Now, for those who are really passionate about preaching the gospel, for those who are really passionate about talking to your faith, about especially your family members, how do you, how do you, will you respond when somebody comes up to you and says, well, don't tell me about your Jesus. Look at all your church leaders. They're all hypocrites, they're all liars, and they're all manipulators. How would you respond? How would, how would you respond? You want to know how I would respond? I would look at them in the face and I go, I know. And I agree. Don't even need to look at them. Just look at me. Hypocrite? Yeah, okay. Liar? Okay. Manipulator? Okay, maybe that's a bit of a stretch for me. Okay, I don't, I can't, I, I don't know if I'm a manipulator. But yeah, I, I think there are times that maybe I don't tell the whole truth. Uh, I think there are times where I tell you to do A, but I do B instead. I'm a sinner. They are sinners. I'm not talking to you about their faith. I'm talking to you to put your faith in Jesus. It's not about Ravi. It's not about Carl. It's not about Jerry. It is not about me. It's about Jesus. And that's how you should respond. We as humans will always be liars and hypocrites. Yes. But Jesus isn't. And that's why I still hold on to my Jesus because he is the perfect lamb and the perfect lion that saved me from my sins. That's why I need Jesus. How do we preach the gospel now? I think that, I think I kind of repeated the question. Same thing. How do we preach the gospel? We preach the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ. It's not the gospel of Rabbi Zacharias. It's not the gospel of Carl. It's not the gospel of Isaac. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the gospel. He encapsulates the gospel. He is the word of God. We preach Jesus. And when people look at you and say, you Christians are hypocrites, I will look back, I will look them in the eye and say, yes, I know. I am one. Out of all of you people, 300, 200 people here today, any one of you dare, dare say you are not a hypocrite? You ever dare say that you ask somebody to wash the dishes, but the next moment you're supposed to wash the dishes, you don't? That's a hypocrite. I don't even want to talk about the laws of God. Let's talk about your own laws. I'm sure you do. But that's why we need Jesus. Exactly, what, exactly why we need to be saved. That's why I'm telling you about Jesus. Because I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We need Jesus. That's how we preach the gospel. I hope, that, I hope that resonates with you. And in my last point, what are the practical ways that we can help our fellow Christians from falling? So I want to end with this. So this is my last point before I call Aaron to, to sing the, the, the closing song. I really want us now to, besides all these theories, right? What are the practical ways that we can help our fellow Christians from falling? Um, and I want to talk to all of, well, I'm talking to all of you, uh, to take it seriously. I think one practical way to help us from falling is to connect, is to be together. And that will help us from falling. That's just the truth. And to be connected with each other just means that, you know, hey, you know my life and I know yours. And sooner or later, something bad in my life will, will surface. It's hard to keep a sin a sin for too long. It will come out. It will surface. But nobody can call you out. Nobody can talk to you if you are not connected with anybody. 
And you cannot talk to anybody if you are not connected to anybody. And I want to talk about the principle of accountability here. Now, it's very easy when Christian says, we need to be accountable for, our, for each other's lives. We need to be accountable. And we then get mentors, we get accountability partners, and we realize that, no, it doesn't work. You know, I can't be calling you every day, ask you, did you sin? Did you sin? Did you watch porn? Did you watch porn? Did you watch porn? What, every day? What am I, your father? You know, what am I, your Holy Spirit? You know, I can't do that. So it, then we go, it doesn't work. Can I just say the principle of accountability is not that the accountability partner calls you out. The principle of accountability is that you tell your accountability partner on your free will and volition. That's accountability. It's not for the other person to keep calling you out. It's for you to have somebody, a safe person to say, look, I have fallen in this area. I need you to help restore me to the body of Christ. I encourage you, get an accountability partner. You need somebody that you can trust. You do. For example, if you ask me to be your accountability partner, trust me when I tell you, I will not call you every day to ask you whether you sin. I will not even call you every week. I may not even call you every month. I don't think I have that space and capacity and time. But if you want me to be your accountability, I will. But it's on you to tell me when you have sinned. It is on you to tell me when you have watched porn. It is on you to tell me that you are cheating on your spouse. I'm not going to call you out. You come to me. And when you come to me, I will be your safe space. I will pray with you and I will journey with you. Now, I'm not asking all 300 of you to come and talk to me. Find your leader that you can trust. They will not judge you. They will not condemn you. Find that person and say, I want to come clean. This is not an Isaac principle. This is a biblical principle. It says, repent before God and repent before your fellow Christians. Oh, for the life of me, I should have found out where that is from. If you, if you know that Bible verse, please put it in the chat group so that you know that I'm talking, I'm talking Bible. Okay, I'm not talking crazy things. It's true. Find somebody so that you can repent of your sins. So these are practical ways for us to uh, uh, maintain our faith when we see some fallen leaders. Last point before I call Aaron. I call everybody to live a life of integrity. Not perfection. Integrity. What is integrity? Integrity, people always think integrity means, oh, I'm integrous. I'm perfect. I will never fall. No. Integrity means that, yes, I will try my best to live a good life. But when I fall, I am man enough to repent of my ways. That's integrity. How do you be an integrous spouse? You think you will never quarrel with your spouse? I'm sure you will at some point of your life. Integrity is when you say, I quarreled with you, whether you're right or whether I'm wrong, I will say I'm sorry. That's integrity. That sorry is really the hardest word to say. There are many, many people out there the last thing they'll say to you is sorry. They would rather buy you a tea life to show that they are sorry rather than say sorry. That's just the truth. Am I not right? They would rather do something nice for you to show that they are remorseful of their situation, but they'll never say sorry. Sorry is really the hardest word. What's integrity? Repent. Say you're sorry. You need opportunity, of course. But yeah, do it. I would like to think that we are all integrous in our ways. And I believe if we are, we will finish the race. So why am I saying all this? Why am I being so intense on a Wednesday night? Is because I hope that all of you here will finish the race. Do you know that one of my biggest fears of being a pastor, this is my biggest fear of being a pastor, is not, it's not the public speaking is not the preparing a sermon, reading the Bible. That's not, you know, if you ask me, pastor, to be a pastor, you need to read 30 chapters a day. That, that don't scare me much, you know, uh, that don't. Uh, I can read 30 chapters a day, that's fine. Pastor, to be a pastor, you need to write a, 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 a theological paper every day. I, I will be more than happy to do that. That's easy. What fears me being a pastor is, is in the Bible. When I teach the word of God, 
I don't live up to the word of God. I see Jesus again. He will hold me accountable of my sins. That's what I fear. I fear that pastoring all of you, God says you as a pastor are accountable and responsible for your sheep. And one day I will be held responsible and accountable for all of you. And what is the accountability? The accountability is not that you guys are perfect or you guys are whatever. The accountability is that you guys are, hold strong to your faith, that we will run this race together and we will finish the race and finish the fight. And we will finish it strong and we will finish it together. Together, we will overcome. How? By repentance. Oh, really, really last point. You know, in Revelations, you know why I, more I read Revelations, the more I really, really burn with the, the word together, burn in zealousness for the word together. Because when I read about the seven churches and it talks about when God rebukes the seven churches and even back in the Old Testament in Joshua's time when he rebuked, uh, when he rebuked Achan or in, in Manglish he rebuked Achan, whatever it is, okay? Um, when God rebuked Achan because of Achan's sin, who did he punish? He punished the community. He punished Israel for one man's sin. When the church in Revelation sinned, I don't believe it was 100% because God always says, there are some of you that do well. He always says, read it well. There are some of you that run the race. There are some of you who are faithful. There are some of you who do well. Then he says, but, but I rebuke you for X, Y, Z. He rebukes every church for different reasons. And then he says, I warn you, church, if you don't overcome, it will not look good for you in the end times. He rebukes the church. He doesn't rebuke one man. Therefore, I believe that if one of us, we are a young adult community, if one of us sin, especially me, especially me because, like it or not, I'm called to lead the young adults ministry. If one of us sin, God will not look at you as a, and he says, oh, you sin, I punish you. He will look at the church. He will look at the young adults ministry. And he says, the way you overcome is all of you now have to repent for the sins of one man. The whole Israel have to repent for the sins of one man. When, 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 when Moses came down the mountain and they were building a golden calf, read carefully in the book of Exodus, not every Israelite participated. But God says, I am ready to get rid of everybody, including the righteous and the unrighteous. I'm willing to wipe Israel clean and start again. Why? Because when God sees the church, he doesn't see one man. He sees a together. He sees a body. And we are that body. So I'm calling all of us for us to be faithful, for us to really come before God and to ask God to give us clean hands.